Thank you, Kim. Good morning, Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. Welcome if you're here live. Welcome if you are tuning in via cable or internet. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a good day for worship. We want to take a moment and just center ourselves with prayer, and then Sam's going to come and lead us in our worship time. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to take a deep breath of your spirit. It's been a busy week, Father, and there's so much going on. But Father, we just pray that in these moments you would steal our attention. Keep us from stressing about what happened last week or what we have to do this week or what's going to happen next today and help us to just stay focused on this moment with you. May these moments of worship, Father, be transformational. May we tune in to you with grace. May we come to you in spirit and in truth. May we throw all that we are into the next hour, eager to get to know you better, eager to glorify your name. Thank you for surrounding us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for guiding us in these moments. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ and all God's people said, amen. Welcome to worship. Welcome, Sam, Kim, Jenny. Good morning. Good morning again. I'll try that with my microphone on. It keeps Nick a lot happier when I do that. Hey, a reminder that Easter is not over. It's really just begun. Our linens say, He is risen. He is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. How about I say, He is risen, and you say, Alleluia. How about that? He is risen. Let us stand and let us sing. Hallelujah. Let us join together as we all pray as one. O God of all of our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast love to all people everywhere. Amen.
do it in reverse. Alleluia. Amen. You may be seated. Are there children that would like to come up front for the children's sermon? I knew Selena was here. Oh, gosh. Selena, it looks like it's you and I, girl. Hi, honey. Question, Selena. Which, which is more important, that we sleep or that we're awake? Hmm. Sleep tank, maybe. Okay. How about should we be more concerned about eating or drinking? Mm. Well, eating, you think? Okay. Should, should we be more worried whether we're breathing or our hearts beating? Oh, we need kind of both of those, don't we? Yeah. You know, here's the deal, Selena. It talks in the Bible about how we should worship God in spirit and in truth. Hmm. Which is more important? They're both important. We need to breathe, and we need to have our heart beating. We need to eat, and we need to drink. We need to sleep, and we need to be awake. We can't say one's more important than the other. So today we're going to talk about what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. Since you're probably, well, you'll be here for a bit, so you'll hear this later, but it's really important that we worship God with all of who we are, and that we learn more about God. We can't do one or the other. We have to do both. So when you think about coming to worship, think about, gee, I wonder what I'm going to learn about God today. And I wonder how I can say thank you with all of who I am. Because that's what worship's all about. I hope you had a great Easter. Now, you guys don't know this, but Selena and I worshiped together last week at 6.30 in the morning, huh? Was it warm out, Selena? No. She was wrapped up in a blanket. But she was there, huh? And we had a good time. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us about who you are every Sunday. Help us to worship you with all that we are, all of our strength, all of our energy. In Jesus' name, amen. By lollipop, hon. Let me share with you a few prayer concerns this morning. We want to continue to pray for Jerry Hanna. He got a good report from his surgeon this week about his eye. Um, so it's coming along, and he's got a lot less restrictions, which means that we don't have to pray for Shar as much this week. That's good. One month old little baby, Liam McVeigh, has got some health concerns that they're trying to figure out. So be praying for the McVeigh family as they wait for some test results. Sharon Demick continues to recover from hip surgery. Linda Zetwick, Zetwick continues to recover in Erie. And a cousin of Nate Sheets, Danny Joe Baker, needs prayer as he recovers from surgery. One last prayer concern, there was a tragic accident last Sunday night. A 22-year-old college senior by the name of Sam 
Kearney was killed in an automobile accident. So Sam is the son of Shelley Kearney, and that's the cousin of Gloria Garland. Gloria is a part of our congregation, so we'll be praying for that extended family. Um, I can't imagine the, the pain that they are in grieving that loss. I want to say what a blessing last Sunday was. Um, it was tiring, but it was good. And uh, if you weren't here, or if you didn't uh, watch us, uh, boy, it was, it was an off-the-hook worship experience. And several times I thought we could have just said amen and gone home because we'd been to church. And it just kept getting better and better each service. So uh, it was good. I was really kind of disappointed. I told Sam this this week. The one song we sang at 9.35 and 11, there's a long pause in it. And he got really good at the 11 o'clock service at holding that pause. And I thought, sure, he was going to jump up in the air and do a split and land on the stage and keep singing, but he didn't. We're working on that. What's that? I wouldn't have wanted that. (laughs) It was just that kind of Sunday morning, though. I mean, anything could have happened, amen? It was good. It was a good day of worship last week, and gosh, it, uh, I left here just knowing I'd been in the presence of God and knowing that God had shown up in a powerful way, and, and that's always a good day. All right, let's pray. Father God, there are many among us who still struggle. Some fathers still are recovering from covid Some have gotten their vaccines and they're not feeling well. Some, Father, are grieving the loss of a loved one. Some are recovering from surgery. Some, Father, are day in, day out, struggling with major health issues. But in all of that, Father, we know that you are present. You have blessed us with incredible medical communities that care for us. You have blessed us with modern medicine that helps our bodies to recover in ways that years ago would have been unthinkable. And Father, on the difficult days, you remind us that you have never left us and you're right there with us. Father, for the families who are grieving, we ask your grace. What a difficult thing, Father, to surrender a loved one into your hands and know that it will be a while before we see them again. We are indeed so excited for their wholeness, their victory. But Father, it is so hard to be without them. So we pray this day, Lord, that you would give us grace through those moments. Father, walk with us as we are challenged at work and at school and in our community and in our families to be your followers and to live the way you've called us to live. It's easy, Father, to slip into bad habits. It's easy to listen to the world, to listen to the enemy, to believe lies and half-truths instead of the truth of who you are and who you've called us to be. Father, this morning we pray that you would help us to hear again the truth and live by it. Continue to walk with us in these moments of worship, Father, that these may be glorious moments. Moments that give us an opportunity to honor and praise you. Moments that give us an opportunity to learn about who you are. Moments that help us to put life in perspective. We ask all these things, Father. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I was thinking this morning of a former and long-term pastor of this church, John Sass. And uh, top on the list of his favorite hymns was the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. We're going to use that tune today. And I'm thankful for a, a girl named Carolyn Gillette who wrote these words to it. Let us stand and let us sing The Water God Gives Us. The be seated. It was, a, uh, it was a tough call to end our scripture reading at 26 verses. We could have gone through um, the first 42 verses of John 4 to get the whole story, but we're going to stop at 26 and kind of go from there. So if you'll take out your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, we want to hear what God's Word has to tell us in this story today about Jesus and a woman. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, 
You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. She replied, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when a true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus is beginning to hear rumblings in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area that the Pharisees are starting to take notice of his ministry. We are a chapter after he has had this interesting interaction with Nicodemus in John 3, who's part of that ruling class, who comes at night to try to figure out what exactly Jesus is all about. And Jesus knows that his time has not yet come. So the last thing he wants is to this whole thing to go political. So Jesus decides it's time to go back home and do ministry farther out in the outskirts of the kingdom. The problem is to get to Galilee from Judea Samaria is in the way. So where is Samaria? Well, boy, that's hard to see from here, isn't it? Okay, put on your binoculars. I cheat. I got new glasses this week, so I can see really good-ish. I can see good here. Here, not so good. Trying to zoom yesterday on the computer, everybody's blurry. So you got to look like this. Then you look like you're just being arrogant and you got your nose in the air. Anyway, Judea is part of the southern kingdom. Galilee is part of the northern kingdom. Between the two is Samaria. So here's the issue with Samaria. When the northern kingdom fell in the 8th century before Christ, The Assyrians come in and exported a lot of the Jews and imported some of the other captive peoples they had in their nation. Therefore, polluting, if you will, the gene pool. These people brought with them not just their own genetics, but of course their religion. And they developed what was called an asyncretist religion. That means instead of changing faith, you just keep adding things. You're kind of a collector of faith. Some of you know Christian comedian from years ago by the name of Mike Warrenkey. He told a story about being in Vietnam, and he met a guy that had a chain around his neck, and he had a cross, he had a star and crescent, 
He had a star of David. He had a little bit of goat's hair. And Mike said, what's with the chain? He said, I believe. And Mike said, I, I, okay, but in what? I can't tell from the chain. He said, at this point, I can't afford to make anybody unhappy. And that's who Samaria was. They believed in everything. They didn't want to make anybody unhappy. So a little bit of the one true God, a little bit of Baal, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And in the intertestamental period before Jesus, they even dedicated their temple at Mount Gerizim to the Greek god Zeus. They worshipped everything, which is the same as worshipping nothing. You get that, right? Okay. The other problem with the Samaritans was that they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They didn't didn't read the prophets. They didn't read the writings, which included the whole book of Psalms and all that wonderful worship liturgy and worship song. So when Jesus says, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we know, what he's saying is, you've only got a little bit of the truth. We've got the whole of God's word. You only know this much. We know more. Salvation comes from the Jews. So Samaria is in a weird location. When the southern kingdom falls to the Babylonian nation and they are exported down the road, they are allowed to come back and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. One source says the Samaritans thought that was a bad idea, and they resisted rebuilding the wall. Another source says that they offered to help, and the Jews said, thank you, no. You guys don't get to help because you're not true followers of Yahweh. So there was bad blood, to put it mildly. Isn't it interesting, though, that when Jesus chooses a people group to make the hero in one of his stories The story of a a guy who's robbed and left half dead on the road, who's walked around by a, a couple of religious officials. Who's the hero of that story? A Samaritan. A Samaritan? Now you know why people went, are you serious? A Samaritan would never do that. Well, to get... To Galilee, you either had to go through Samaria or what a lot of Jews did was they made a hard right. They went across the Jordan River. They went around Samaria and came into Galilee that way. The problem was that trip took six days. The way Jesus went took three. So he had to go through Samaria. The question is, did he have to go because God knew that he was going to bring this woman into his experience? Or did he have to go because it was just the shortest route? Scholars can't decide. The other part of this story that's problematic is uh, the fact that there's a woman in it. Hmm. Interesting. A faithful Jew in Jesus' day would not be seen in public speaking with a woman alone who was not his wife unless her husband was there. You know, Scripture says, not even the appearance of evil. Not even the appearance. Remember, we've talked about Billy Graham. In his lifetime of ministry, he would never be seen riding in a car alone with a woman, not his wife. He would not be seen going out to dinner alone with a woman, not his wife. Why? not even the appearance of evil. And yet here's Jesus, tired as he is from the journey, sitting at the well, and along comes a woman. There's so much about what's going on in the dynamic of that moment. Um, Scholars spend pages (laughs) talking about it. A, she's a woman. He should not be seen in public talking to a woman alone. B, she's a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans have nothing to do with each other. C, 
It's noon. Who fetches water at noon? That's not when everybody else does it. It's the worst part of the day. That's like mowing your grass at noon. Bad plan. If you're going to die a heat stroke, it's going to happen between like noon and three, right? Not when you want to do it. You got to give time for the dew to burn off. I get that. But you don't want to do it in the heat of the day. So why is she there in the heat of the day? And that's led to all kind of conjecture, as you know. Especially when we hear the part of the story that says, um, you've had five husbands and the guy you're living with is not your husband. Let's remember, gentlemen, before we get too down on this lady, a woman had no ability to divorce anyone in that culture in that day. She was not the one getting divorces. It was her husband's. Now, the argument may be able to be made that there was something about her that caused repetitive divorce. But even in our culture today, if I came to this church and was introduced to the SPRC as the new pastor, and I said, now I've been divorced five times, people go, huh? Right? There is a stigma attached to this woman. She's cohabitating out of wedlock. She's been divorced five times. And perhaps she comes at noon because she's just sick and tired of hearing the things people are saying about her. True or not, she's tired of it. And she encounters Jesus. Isn't it interesting that not only this woman, but the women at the tomb on Easter Sunday morning play so prominently Anytime somebody wants to tell you that women are second-class citizens, take them back to Scripture. Because they do not play a second-hand role. They play a primary role. The woman at the well, she isn't even given a name. But boy, does she have an impact. So there's some significant things about Jesus' interaction with this woman. Let me quick share with you three of them. This is perhaps the longest encounter between Jesus and another individual in the Gospels. There's that many verses written about this lady whose name we don't even know and Jesus. I read you, you know, 20... Uh, 26 verses, but uh, there's, there's more to the story about what happens after the disciples get back and what she does and what the townspeople do, which is absolutely stellar. She's like the women at the tomb. Maybe he knew that she would be like CNN. Maybe God knew that the women at the well or the women at the tomb would be like CNN and spread the gospel much better than the men. So this is a lengthy encounter. This is not a brief few words. They have significant conversation. And it's interesting conversation. Some have conjectured that her immediate response to Jesus when he says, will you give me a drink? And her response is, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? It's similar to her saying, whoa, 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 you treat us like dirt. And yet when you're in need, we're good enough to meet that need. Seriously? That's how you're going to approach this, Jesus? Why would you even ask me for a drink? Jews would not share utensils with Samaritans. She's got one water vessel. She's already touched it. For a Jew, that makes it unclean. When Jesus starts talking about living water, she immediately assumes that he's talking about running water. This particular well is a well where the water percolates up through the ground, not a free-flowing stream. And so she's confused. He begins to talk about water that will well up within 
and bring eternal life so that you're never thirsty again. He's talking about spiritual drink. She's still stuck on physical drink and says, gosh, I'll never get thirsty again. I won't have to come and draw. Give me some of that. That's what I want. It's not until this conversation turns to who she is and she can no longer hide that things get serious. Go call your husband. She's been found out. She doesn't lie, but the truth is hard to share. I don't have a husband. And she leaves it at that. But he, being God incarnate, he knows the whole story. You're right, he says. You've had five. And the guy you're living with, you're not married to. How's he know this? Our next assumption is absolutely accurate. I can see you're a prophet. Well, while we're here, let's get some things settled. Where should we worship? He says, that's not what we're here to talk about. But he shares with her what true worship really is all about. Isn't it interesting that at the end of the story that where we stopped, in verse 26... Jesus identifies himself as the Messiah. This is not only the first, but perhaps the only place in the Gospels that Jesus says, I am the Messiah. He claims deity often. That's why they're constantly trying to kill him. And that's the final charge for his crucifixion is blasphemy. He's claiming to be God. But Messiah, this is the only place, scholars think, where he clearly says to a woman, a Samaritan woman, I who speak to you, I am he. You see, Jesus is constantly telling people, don't tell anybody what you know. Because he doesn't want his ministry to get turned into a political football. And in Jerusalem, that's likely to happen. But here in Samaria, there's a freedom. He doesn't need the secrecy. They're not politically connected. And here in the fourth chapter of John, early in the story, early in his ministry... He says to this woman, I'm the one. I'm the one. It's no wonder she ran back to town, leaves her water jar there, forgets about the fact that nobody in town respects her or likes her, and she's been trying to avoid those people all day. She goes back and shares the gospel. You see, Jesus talks to this woman and shares in this community because he wants to make it clear that although the Jews don't like Samaritans, there's nobody outside his grace. No people group. Gender's not an issue. Religious confusion is not a problem. Isn't that amazing? In the fourth chapter of John, He makes it clear, grace is for everyone. He's not about drawing a fence and saying, nope, 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 nope. You people stay out. Only these folks can come in. He says, what I'm about to do is for everyone. Everyone. I dare say we should not fence what God has not fenced. There's no one who's not worthy of walking through the door. There's no one who God doesn't love enough to pour the blood of Christ on and to redeem them. Even people we don't like, people we think don't have it all together, people that we think are theologically confused, God's concerned about them. Grace for all. 
This whole story, though, comes down to a couple of simple words that he shares with this woman. When she wants to challenge him on where we should worship, he makes this statement. Worship in the spirit and in truth. Worship in the spirit and in truth. The biggest problem with worship in our culture is it goes one of two ways in my understanding and in my experience. We have people that want to worship just in spirit, and it becomes emotionalism. Or we have people that only want to talk about truth, and it becomes legalism. God wants both. Using psychological terms, he wants our left brain and our right brain. The left brain, as you know, is very logical, very linear. It's all about information. It's all about two plus two is four, black and white. It's right or it's wrong. What do I need to know? The right brain, that's where beauty lives. That's where emotion lives. That's where joy lives. And when he says spirit and truth, One way of looking at it is he's saying left brain and right brain. Come to me with all you've got and in balance. You see, spirit and truth is about coming into the presence of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit and with all that we are. Every Jewish child is taught the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4 is the verse, hear, which the Hebrew word there is Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. And then it says, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That text is all about entering into worship with all that I am, without reservation, I would say whole-brained. Seeking information, that's truth. I need to learn about God at every turn. If I don't understand who God is and what he's calling me to, if I don't grow more knowledgeable and deeper in my understanding of God, my worship will stagnate. It'll just become pure emotionalism. But if I come only seeking the facts, only seeking information... Then I become someone who simply occupies a pew and doesn't move. That's one of the things that the um, charismatic and Pentecostal movement has brought back to the church is is a worship that is wholly right-brained. It comes with the spirit. I was serious last week when I said we could have sang the first song at 8.15 and gone home. Because we had had church, folks. There wasn't much truth-telling, but that experience was so spirit-laden. I don't know if it's because I'd been up early and already been to the river. I don't know if it's because I was excited about Easter and all that that encompasses. But when we sang those three verses and then jumped to our feet and sang, Up from the grave he arose, I was done. I had had a spiritual experience. And there was so much more to come. There was Amy Weimer's solo. There was time spent in the Word. There was, there was time connecting with you folks, which was all great. You see, at some point, I have to be willing to engage with who I am, the very soul of who I am. We got to 9.35 and 11, and, and Sam put in that song, Oh My Soul. We'd only sung it one other Sunday. But when we began to sing that song, my spirit rose again. I had the advantage at uh, 9.35 of sitting in that chair, and I watched, and there were people who normally don't move, tapping the end of the pew. Their feet are going. They were into it. The spirit was percolating. That's worshiping in spirit. Are you willing to walk into this sanctuary and say, God, 
If you call me to raise my hand and to shout out, I'm going to stop worrying about embarrassment and I'm going to do it. Lord, if you call me to cry, I'm going to cry. If you call me to laugh, I'm going to laugh. If you call me to sing, I'm going to sing, whether I can sing well or not. What Psalms say? This is Daryl's favorite verse. Make a joyful noise. Now, there's a reason you don't let me play piano. You get that, right? It would be a noise. But you know what? At what point did God say, I only want to hear from the really high quality singers in your congregation? It's not in the book. I'm not offending his ears. If I'm offending his, yours, sorry. I'm not singing for you. I'm singing for him. Worship is about an audience of one. We're not here to impress one another with our ability to sing, our ability to play, our ability to raise our hands at the right spot in the song. No. We're here to honor and worship the one true God. And if what we do here isn't about him, then we shouldn't be doing it. Worshiping in spirit. It's hard as Methodists because we tend to be a little more um, rigid. Not as rigid as some, but clearly not as free to worship in spirit as others. The truth part comes from what are we learning about God? Now, when I drop my guard, when I put my whole self into a worship experience, I begin to learn more about God. I begin to see him for who he is, how he operates. I allow the word to teach me, and my worship becomes better informed. There's your truth part. But it's got to be in balance. It's not all about learning. It's not all about emotionalism. It's about both. And good worship does both. It teaches and it elevates our soul into the presence of God. I love good worship. And I'm going to say this out loud. Whether you're watching remotely or in person, you all are spoiled. You don't know that. Because many of you, this is the only place you've worshipped. And this is so common and so familiar to you that you have no idea how spoiled you are. You've had Sam and Kim here for over a quarter of a century. And they have taught you how to worship well. Look, I have served those churches where there's nobody that can play an instrument. We're doing it off CDs. And nobody can sing. It sounds like a bunch of cats with their tails under rockers. And we call it worship. The only good news is we're doing it from our heart. It might be pleasing to God, but the rest of us are just cringing the whole way through. That's not what you have, is it? Nah, we are blessed. When you walk through the door, do you come ready to engage with all of who you are? When you walk through the door, do you recognize that God is eager to connect with you, whether you're male or female, whether you're young or old? Whether you've served on every committee in this church or you've never served a day in your life. Whether you've been at this journey for six decades or you found out about Jesus yesterday. God is so excited about being connected to you. And he wants you to bring all that you are and dump it right here in worship to him. And he will pour into you some truth that will transform your life the way it did this woman at the well. When you have time this afternoon, read the next 20 verses of this story. She runs back to time. 
shares with them what, they've, what she's experienced, and they come running out to Jesus, and they make a request of Jesus that he says yes to that should blow you away. Here's the interesting thing. Fast forward the tape to the book of Acts, the eighth chapter, post-death, burial, and resurrection, post-Pentecost. You know that the apostle Peter and the apostle John find themselves back in Samaria, and you know what they're doing? They're pouring out the Holy Spirit on people. Probably the very same people who had heard this woman's testimony and came to Christ under her tutelage. God just keeps blowing me away with truth. I hope you're willing to come and sit and allow him to connect with you and teach you every time you worship. There's so much more we could talk about with this text. God is spirit. Man, there's a sermon right there. I do hope you know that worship takes place other places than here. It ought to take place in your life someplace every day. Maybe when you wake up and realize I've survived another night. Or maybe when you realize I'm going to be okay today because I'm walking with the Savior. Our call is to worship in spirit, to worship in truth. Let's pray. Father, remind us that you are spirit and that we can connect with you spiritually through the power of the Holy Spirit in so many ways. Help us to drop our guard, Father, to enter into your presence with all that we are, that your truth may come into our lives and transform us the way it did the woman at the well. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in the mess that we are. And thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to not leave us there, but to desire to change us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Let us stand. Let this be our prayer. Let this be part of our response to God's word today. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it Isn't it nice how that song talks about the truth and the spirit? Bread of heaven, feed me, feed me. Feed me with your word. And then fill my cup, fill my spirit with your spirit. Let's sing. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for filling us today. Thank you for being the bread of heaven, for feeding us, for instructing us, and for uh, just breathing your spirit into our spirit, making it alive again. Lord, uh, we have that to be thankful for and so much more. Lord, we thank you that we can live in the spirit of resurrection daily. We live because you live. So thank you, God. Now, as we conclude our moments, Father, we offer our gifts to you. We offer them today and in the days ahead as people respond to you with tithes and offerings. Receive them, O God, and use them so that others may know the same Jesus that loved the woman at the well uh, so that they may know that he loves them too. So use these gifts, bless each gift, bless each giver. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you for your ongoing support, church, and those watching. And a slide is available now to those of you watching from uh, home and online. If you're part of some other church, we encourage you to support your local church first. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. A couple of quick announcements as we come to our closing moments and a reminder that, you know, you may be, um, you may be in a place where you heard this call to spirit and truth worship different than you ever have, and you may need to talk about that. Let me remind you that you can still call us. Sam and I are more than eager to talk to you, and if you'll call the church and hit prompt four, just Punch in four after it answers, and it'll take you right to our mailbox, and it'll send us an email, and we'll get it immediately. We may have to wait till after church to call you, because it'd be really obnoxious if you call us, and then in the middle of the 8 or 9.35 service, Sam's up here leading worship, talking to you on the phone, or I'm in the, you know, you get it. It might be a little, but we'll get back to you. Hey, today we want to, um, to celebrate a 100th birthday, Elaine Young's mother, Jean Harshberger is 100 years old today. What an exciting thing. So, um, boy, we're just, we're celebrating with her. She watches us every Sunday. And um, Jean, happy birthday. We hope it goes well with you today. Let me share with you that the final arrangements for Tishway's funeral have been made um, Saturday, the 24th of April. Funeral's going to be here. You can come at 10 o'clock for a time of visiting, and 11 o'clock we're going to do memorial service right here in the sanctuary. So please put that on your calendar. Okay? We're looking for some volunteers, some folks to do uh, flower ministry. This week we're doing a drive through dinner. We're looking for people to bake cakes and cookies. Um, candy's out, so you need to let Ann know whether you can bake cookies or cakes. She's looking for help there. We're also looking for some ushers. Um, to help out in the services. Speaking of ushers, thank you to the ushers for last week. I mean, man, if they'd have had Fitbits on, they'd have broken their Fitbits, I think, back and forth, seating all the people. But they made Easter Sunday morning so much easier, didn't they? So thank you to you volunteer ushers. One last piece, the day after Tisha's memorial service on the 25th, it's a Sunday afternoon, starting at 2 o'clock from 2 to 4.30, there's a pretty exciting opportunity happening. It's sponsored by the Franklin District, District Anti-Racism Committee. It's called Things We Don't Talk About at Church. Guess what we're going to do? Talk about them at church. We're going to talk about racism within church, sexism within church, bullying and toxic relationships within church. Our church is one of the satellite locations that's going to have that fed right to the screen. You can gather here and do that that Sunday afternoon. You can also do it by Zoom if you'd like. There are flyers out on Ann's desk. You need to register so you can get the Zoom link or show up here, but you still need to register so we know how many to expect. It's all on the flyer, okay? And um, 
Wade Berkey from First United Methodist is one of the presenters, and my good friend Keith Dunn and his wife Alice Weaver Dunn will be some of the presenters. So um, it will be interesting. Just trust me on that. Keith's never presented anything that wasn't interesting. Hey, I hope you are going to have a great Sunday. I hope you sense God in everything you do today. Go in peace now. May the peace of Christ go with you. Amen. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to